Strike your colors, Penguin! Oh, we have not yet begun to fight! Attack! Back at it again with another Batman video, this time talking about the first ever Batman movie. Now for some reason, a lot of the time Tim Burton's Batman is credited as being the Dark Knight's first outing on the big screen. But the truth of the matter is, is that there was one that came out years and years before it. A movie which also saw Batman go toe to toe with the Clown Prince of Crime, as well as a fury of his other foes as well. I'm talking of course about Batman, the movie. This movie is based on the famous, and hilariously in hindsight, infamous 1966 show. The film would hit theaters only two months after the first season of the show wrapped up on air, which is kinda crazy when you think about it. The show gets picked up, and immediately after completing its first 34 episodes, the studio then makes the decision to make a movie. Batman the movie feels very much like a product of the product. It's a solid representation of the season that came before it, as well as the two seasons that would follow after. It feels exactly like the show just brought to a grander stage with a bigger budget. Which, I guess, is exactly what it is. I know this might seem strange to highlight, but I'm coming off the heels of watching the Batman vs. Dracula movie, which was a movie that did not do a good job of representing the show that it was based on. So I really want to rain down my praise on this film for perfectly portraying the show of the same name. And I'll be real with you, this is far from my favorite version of the character. I think by now everyone who's familiar with either myself or the channel knows that I prefer broody Batman to campy caped crusader. But I've really come to appreciate and maybe even love this live action Saturday morning cartoon version of the hero. I think it's harmless goofy fun with the IP and I do have some nostalgia for it from having grown up watching reruns on TV Land. This series may not have a lot of brains, but it does have a lot of heart. There was definitely a point in my life where I found this cool to hate, but in my later years I find it very endearing. It's something to just turn your brain off and watch. Of course it's not an accurate representation of where the characters ended up now, but it is the starting point for the character in major media, and it's interesting to look back on and see how much the brand has evolved. Now if you're going into this with limited knowledge of the original series, I would still say that it's probably a fair starting point, especially considering that the movie was initially intended to act as a cinematic pilot of sorts, an introduction for the rest of the series. Of course ultimately that didn't wind up happening and this takes place later in the series, but it's still an easy watch and not hampered down with its connection to a wider continuity. So if this is somehow your first Batman 66 outing, what you need to know is that nothing ever makes sense, and that's alright. You will never be able to solve the Riddler's riddles, because the answers to his question lie in no semblance of sense. Characters will jump to ridiculous conclusions following severe lapses in logic, and yet somehow, they will still arrive at the right answer. Like take this scene for example where all the do-gooders are trying to figure out the identity of the villain responsible for getting one over on the dynamic duo. Pretty fishy what happened to me on that ladder. The penguin. It happened at sea. See? See for Catwoman. An exploding shark was pulling my leg. The Joker. It all adds up to a sinister riddle. What the riddle? The four of them. Like, uh, wh what do you say to that? They all just made predictions based on let's be nice and say circumstantial evidence, and immediately they treat their pondering as if it's fact. And because this is Batman 66, it is! Or how about the little masks that the villain wear in this scene? Like, is that a fashion choice, or are they trying to conceal their identity? I mean, Riddler and Catwoman wear those masks throughout the series, so I'm not taking issue with their fashion choices. But Joker and Penguin do not. Is this them attempting to commit a crime and not get caught? Because you're both still wearing your full villain costumes. And you're not doing a whole lot to not stand out. What with Joker's green hair, white face, red lips, and painted mustache, and the Penguin's nose and top hat, you're, you're pretty unmistakable. I don't know, this always seems like a strange choice to me. Maybe they're just trying to show solidarity within the ranks of their bickering brotherhood. I don't know. It's something that I've thought about way longer than I ever should. And I know I'll never get an answer to this, but this will never leave my mind. Or how about the fact that the Navy willfully, and without thought, gives the Penguin a submarine? We haven't done anything foolish, have we? Disposing of pre-atomic submarines. Good day, Admiral. Gosh. I could go on and on, but there's really no need to because that's kind of the nature of the beast here. This may be live action, 
but it's still somehow more of a cartoon than the actual Batman cartoons that would follow. It's ridiculous, it's bizarre, it's shamelessly goofy. It's not serious at all, and yet the material kind of takes itself seriously to some degree. The stakes are raised, and we're really supposed to feel for the characters when they're in these situations. And not just point and laugh at the jokes delivered throughout. These are the things that I absolutely hated about this canon as a kid, but love is a man. The criminal underworld is now united in Gotham City. Seeing the likes of the Caped Crusader's most sinister arch enemies combine their efforts to best the hero and make the day theirs. The Joker, the Riddler, the Penguin, the... Cowwoman form an antagonistic alliance. The characters are unsurprisingly hilariously accurate to the Golden Age versions of the characters. Which is no real shock as they're being played by the very actors that made these roles famous. For the most part. The exception, of course, being Catwoman. And I really want to credit her actress, Lee Merriweather, here, as she's the one who's stepping into a world that she's unfamiliar with. And yet, despite being the proverbial new girl in town, she comes off as if she's had residency here for years. Whereas all the other villains and their actors originated from the show, she is the one actor amongst them that is a recast. And yet she blends in with the bunch perfectly. It should also be noted that Catwoman has a fair amount to do in this movie. I think more emphasis is actually put on her than the rest of the baddies. As she's not only Catwoman, thief, and supervillain, but she's also in disguise as the potential love of Bruce's life. She plays the part with all the confidence in the world, and never once does she feel out of place. Despite not originally being from that place. Which is probably why Lee Merriweather would show back up again later on the show, this time as a different character, when original Catwoman actress Julie Newmar would come back to reprise her role. Anytime I've watched this movie, I've always found the oblivious Commodore to be absolutely adorable. He has no idea what's going on, and quite frankly, uh, neither do I most of the time when I watch this movie. But we're both fairly happy in not knowing and enjoying our experience in spite of our lack of knowledge. I gotta give it to the movie, the Batman-Catwoman romance is laughably wonderful. With Bruce being completely smitten with her in disguise, and completely unaware of the blatant foolery. Although to be fair, maybe Batman's just a little bit thrown off by the recast. The villains use the cat as bait to kidnap Bruce Wayne, in the hopes that Batman would come save the billionaire which obviously doesn't happen for the very obvious reason that the two are one and the same. But I just love that everyone is so intellectually incompetent that nobody can figure out the obvious. The villains can't seem to figure out that Wayne is very obviously Batman, despite him laying hands on them in ways that only Batman could. I don't know, maybe the villains were thrown off by the lack of hitboxes saying ow and biff. The alleged world's greatest detective can't figure out that Kitka is Catwoman? I can't figure out why I'm watching this movie? It's a comedy of errors with a festival of fools. Although, I think it just makes things that much funnier when later in the same film, Batman and Robin can very clearly see through one of Penguin's disguises. And it's a disguise that looks like it has much more effort put into it than Catwoman throwing on a leopard print hat. Now you may think to yourself, why can they see through one but not the other? And the answer, of course, is don't think about it. Like I said, the only thing about Batman 66 that makes sense is that nothing in Batman 66 makes sense. They play by their own rules, and they're literally writing and then rewriting the playbook as they go along. And it's then even funnier when Catwoman randomly trips over drops her mask, and reveals the ruse. The movie takes a brief pause to really revel in this revelation. And just... I, I, I'm, I'm without words. It, it's so strange. The patronizing personalities conflict and contrast throughout. Despite their shared interest and hatred of Batman, this team isn't as united as they'd like to say. While they do work together throughout, their differences are clearly working against them and their union. Personally, I think watching this gaggle of giggles, chuckles, and evil laughs interact, undoubtedly the highlight of the film. Having all these larger-than-life personalities all somehow fit into one room, to me, that alone makes this movie worth the watch. While there is a whole lot of this movie I ironically enjoy, I unironically like watching this circle of villains plot, plan, and fail. The banter, the double entendres, the constant alliteration. I just love it. I love all of it. I could watch it all day. The villains in this really don't even have a plan per se, but they have a plethora of plans. Each one going awry because uh, most are not well thought out. 
I like how Batman doesn't even really have to foil their plans. They just kind of do it themselves. Like the villains dehydrating henchmen into piles of dust. This way they can have them infiltrate the Batcave. Then having them rehydrated only to compose into antimatter whenever they make contact with anything else. Eventually the villains take out United World leaders with their dehydrators, but the crime-fighting duo manages to save the piles of dust that the world's learned to call a security council. But through an unfortunate series of event, singular, that is no fault of their own, when they repair the council there are some noticeable differences, with each council member taking on traits of those they share a table with. And this is actually how this movie ends, with Batman openly hoping that this flub-up will cause more good than harm, perhaps make for a more united United Nations. Yeah, I, I, uh, I don't really know about that, Bruce. It all just sounds like wishful thinking to me, if I'm being honest. <laughs> and you thought The Batman was the only movie to end with Batman failing. Not so, because that is the end of 1966's Batman the Movie. So let's get this out of the way, time has obviously not done the movie any favors. Quality boosting art artifacts mostly highlights flaws that were otherwise previously harder to spot. Like when I watched the opening scene, all I'm thinking is, uh, who is that? Who's in the Robin suit here? Because I know that's not Burt Ward. That's Bartholomew Adult Man. I don't, I don't like that, I don't want any part of this. Get, get him off my screen. The fight scenes are... Uh, well, yeah, you remember what the fight scenes are like. They're obviously not good, but they are hilarious. And they're a big part of what this series would become known for. I mean, I don't like them, but in that same breath I wouldn't have it any other way. Because that's what you come to expect from this Batman. So, ultimately, would I recommend this movie? Undoubtedly. If you're looking for good old clean fun, this is the Batman film for you. There's laughs to be had with and also at the expense of this movie. It sits at a runtime that isn't too demanding of its audience, and it's not something you have to devote an excess amount of time to or even attention for. You just turn it on, go about your day, and have some laughs during it. I guess what I'm trying to say is that Batman the movie is just fun. It's probably not the Batman you know, it's the one that your parents or, well, more accurately, grandparents know. I think this should be seen by all Batman fans, and I hope that on some level, it can be appreciated by all Batman fans. I think anyone of any age can watch this and get some enjoyment out of it, whether it be for the reasons that this movie intended, well that's really up to the viewer, but I think that a lot of people would find this highly entertaining so long as they entered without cynicism and knew what they were getting into. Batman? I used to think I'd dress like a bat to instill fear, but recently I've come to realize I just crave attention. <laughs> I spoke about Batman's first outing on the big screen, of course referring to Batman 66's Batman the Movie. Well today, I'm here to talk about one of the other movies in that continuity's lineup, and yes, there is more than one. The late-in-life animated movie Return of the Caped Crusader. A movie that not only saw the return of the Caped Crusader Adam West, but grown boy wonder Burt Ward and OG Catwoman Julie Newmar. Seeing as a fair portion of the original Batman 66 actors had sadly passed away, they were replaced by pretty authentic sound-alikes, and actors that I myself have nothing but love for. With Lynn Marie Stewart, or if you're an Always Sunny fan, Charlie's mother taking over the role of Aunt Harriet. Wally Wingert stepping in for Frank Gorshin as the Riddler, Thomas Lennon bringing his hilariously goofy energy to the role of Chief O'Hara, Jim Ward, or as I know him, Chet Ubecha filling in for Commissioner Gordon, and Steven Weber becoming this movie's Alfred. That's just to name a few. And all of them are very well cast with no one really feeling out of place. Each one is almost a dead ringer for the person they're portraying. Also helping matters is that almost all of the characters are drawn to bear a resemblance to the actors who originally portrayed them. With some exceptions. Commissioner Gordon here is looking a lot more like his comic book counterpart, as opposed to Neil Hamilton, who played him in the series. He's even looking a little bit similar to Alan Napier, who previously played Alfred on the series, with the actual Alfred in this movie looking a bit less like his small screen adaptation. I can only imagine that this is due to licensing issues with the actors' estates. Maybe they didn't have permission to use their likeness, but it is noticeable when you're familiar with the series. Regardless, I still hold this movie in the same regards that I hold the show and movie that spawned this. 
It's very true to the spirit of its predecessor. Not a lot of brains behind what the audience is seeing, but an excess of heart. The movie is an absolute love letter to the original series. There's so much love and care that clearly went into this movie. There's so many references and throwaway lines and cameos to the wider continuity. The intro shows the dynamic duo taking on a gaggle of goons from the series' original run, showing off the forgettable and unforgettable villains of 66's Batman's rogues gallery. And don't quote me, but I also believe that Miranda Monroe, in addition to being an obvious in-world replacement of Marilyn, is named what she's named due to the song that Bruce sings, which is titled Miranda. At one point, the Cape Crusader gets knocked in the head, and in his delusional state, briefly sees three Catwomen, each one resembling one of the three women who played the feline femme fatale, which I think is one of my favorite Batman gags in anything Batman-related ever. The love doesn't stop at the 60s show either. They also show a fair amount of appreciation for other Batman continuities as well. The opening credits show a vast variant of classic Batman comic book covers. Evil Batman literally takes lines from other beloved Batman from other beloved Batman canons, quoting both Batman 1989 and The Dark Knight Returns. Let's get nuts. It's an operating table. Not the face, Batman. I'm the surgeon. The Batcave is shown to have a lineup of famous bat suits not worn within the show. Catwoman even makes a cheeky reference to The Dark Knight Rises. We run away to Europe together, sip tea in a cafe, and live happily ever after. Holy unsatisfying ending. The Riddler even uses an exact riddle that the character used in Gotham. I would assume that that also came from a comic, but I, I can't confirm that, so don't, don't take my word for that. Then there's also Batman taking on the mannerisms of other Batman, including, but not limited to, him suddenly disappearing to which his colleagues note how unlike him that is. These references aren't all that subtle, but then again, subtlety wasn't really the name of the game in the original series. That kinda wasn't Adam West Batman style. I love the nods and references this movie offers up. The show is always a comedic take on the campiness of the characters, but it also, in addition to the regular zany offerings the 66 series brought, this movie likes to take it a step further. It feels like that much more of a cartoon. Because this time around, it is an actual cartoon. It almost makes me wonder how no one thought of doing this before. They did. Greetings, Bat fans. This is Batman. And Robin, the boy wonder. And me too, Batmite. Is that a poop rat? Is that a f***ing poop rat? The movie sees Batman's antagonistic arch enemies reunite once more, just as they did in the first movie. Though ironically, in the original movie, while Catwoman was the only character of the bunch to be recast, this time around, Catwoman is the only returning actor to the role. Their united union of unfortunate events for those they come across are up to their nefarious schemes that seem to get immediately thwarted by the dynamic duo. Or are they? Catwoman drugs Batman with a little catnip, of course, which progressively makes him become more evil with time. Unfortunately for her, after she's fulfilled her usage, the rest of the team cuts her out of their wicked plans and launches her into space. The golden-hearted Not-So-Dark Knight goes from making snide comments at those closest to him to firing all those in his employ, from Alfred to Robin, and then to take matters even further, he goes on to fire the commissioner and the chief of police, as well as everybody else in Gotham City, as Batman has now used a replica ray so that his rogue selves can rule the city. This causes a very unlikely alliance between Robin and Catwoman, who then have to break out and recruit all of the criminals Batman's put behind bars. And what ensues has to be the highlight of the movie. A big battle scene that throws in reference after reference. The penitentiary's past collides with the protagonist here in the present. Though the manpower doesn't seem to be enough, because just as he did solo before, this army of Batman easily defeats the enemies that he's previously put behind bars. Ultimately, it's not the villains who save the day, nor Catwoman or Robin, but in fact Alfred, offering up an anti-anti-antidote. Not kidding. This manages to heal Batman and bring him back to his old ways. Upon his return, he realizes that the whole scheme has been just that. A complete ruse set up by Penguin, Riddler, and Joker so that they can go on a shopping spree sans payment. Batman, Robin, and Catwoman once again team up, and of course put a stop to them. Once again, uh, pretty much with ease. After the battle is finally over and the good guys have won, Catwoman unsurprisingly betrays her new team uh, because she's Catwoman. 
and double crossing is kind of her thing. But her plans are foiled by the attitude of the altitude. Not looking to go back to prison, she jumps to what would otherwise be considered her death, but considering this series, it's really just her latest escape. The credits roll, and we get to see some of our favorite characters from the show bust a move. Because once again, this is Batman 66. I really like this movie, and if you like the seasons of the show or the movie that it spun off, I think you will too. This is some harmless, goofy fun with the characters. And I personally think in terms of funny Batman movies, this should be at the top of that list. Maybe not the tip top, but like, somewhere in the top five. It's a celebration of the original series that bleeds into other versions of the character as well. I'm really glad we got the remaining cast back together for this one. And I'm glad that we got them back together once more after this for Batman vs. Two-Face. Who are you, Two-Face? We're done with your ghoulish games. Then you shouldn't have come here. <laughs> I've recently talked about the follow-up to the 1966 Batman show, uh, Batman. So what better way to follow that up than by talking about the follow-up to the follow-up? I'm talking, of course, about Batman vs. Two-Face, a movie that should be pretty significant to the Batman 66 lore, as this would mark the first appearance of the secondary titular character in the continuity. Unless you're a comic book fan, because in which case this completely different take on the character would be his first appearance, but, you know, I I'm, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. The 1966 show was so campy that it managed to feel more like a cartoon than the actual cartoons that would later be adapted. And because this was just good old clean, goofy fun, it was decided by the higher-ups that the character of Two-Face shouldn't make the cut. So, uh, he was cut never once entering into this Batman's rogues gallery. Though there was apparently a script written for the character in mind, and they even had aspirations of having Clint Eastwood of all people play the role. But that would never come to pass. Once again, unless you're a comic book fan, in which case it was the exact story that was adapted for the comic. And it was also Clint Eastwood's likeness that was used for the character. Again, I'm getting ahead of myself because that comes later. Today, we're going to take a look at Two-Face's first outing in this timeline of events. Like the movie that came before it, I find this incredibly true to its source. Not only do they have the three returning cast members from the previous movie, but there's also even a cameo from Lee Merriweather, who was Julie Newmar's temporary replacement in the first ever Batman movie. Here, Catwoman tricks her character into swapping places with her, and nobody is none the wiser. I love this cute, clever little shout-out. To whoever came up with this bit, my cowl is off to you, sir. Other old-school characters who made cameos in the first animated feature also return here in a little bit more prominent of roles. Batman and Robin encounter King Tut, and after a battle, we even get to see his trial. Afterward, they go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the bookworm and his assistant. This movie, like the movie that came before it, also ends with another big battle of brutes and baddies taking on the bat. It's pretty much ripped straight out of the end of the last movie, but... It's still welcome. There's of course references riddled throughout the runtime, including Batman dropping the line he used in his first ever comic book appearance. And here I thought only criminals were a superstitious lot. And even recreating the classic Batman smack memed around the world. In addition to returning cast, they also have returning tropes and gags including Robin being sickened by Batman's fascination with Catwoman. It's like every time they're about to kiss, he looks like he's about to hurl. I never understood this, because I think it makes Robin look more like a scorned lover than it does a ward. I think the intention was always that Robin was allegedly young, so Batman's, well, let's call them mature feelings for women is icky. But like, Robin, you're too old looking to be acting this young. Although here, they also clarify that it's not just Batman's relationship with women that Robin's intimidated by. Because he also has similarly negative feelings about Harvey Dent. Okay, I got two theories. <laughs> One, Aunt Harriet was actually onto something. Or two, Robin's just an insecure little jerk who's jealous of everyone his mentor shares time with. I like this series, but a lot of the time I have a hard time liking Robin in the series. Let me go on record saying that this is probably my least favorite Robin, so... When thinking of Jason Todd, I'm just looking at this Robin saying... The wrong kid died. The movie also keeps the simple and sometimes stupid logic of the original. 
like having a machine that can physically suck the evil out of someone's soul. Cause you know, of course. Why bother complicating things with reality? I know it sounded condescending when I just said that, but I actually genuinely mean it. This continuity should never be connected to the real world in any way, shape, or form. In terms of what's new, this movie has a lot to offer. They surprisingly simplified and downplayed the darkness of Two-Face to better align him with the canon, and I actually think it works wonders. William Shatner is a pretty inspired choice for the character, as I think he could have been an actual contender for the role back in the day. Like Adam West, he was a star made due to his major role on a hit TV show, and he was a big name during the time of the original series run. William Shatner would have been a great addition back then, and he's a pretty good one now. And let's make it clear, this character doesn't just have Shatner's voice, he also has Shatner's face. Well, a half of it. Now this movie does a very interesting thing with its opening. It sets up the Two-Face character by introducing Harvey Dent, and immediately going into his villainous origin story. Then it allows the opening credit sequence to showcase the character's nefarious schemes, and this opening kinda solidifies him as a villain and molds him into the franchise lore. This is a really good way of making your credits must-see while also still progressively telling your story and showing the passage of time. Though shockingly, the sequence ends with Harvey's face being fixed, which is definitely a strange choice for a movie called Batman vs. Two-Face. So, uh, yeah, I guess that's it, roll credits. As you could probably imagine, that's not the last time we see the other half of that character. Throughout the movie, we're shown Two-Face lurking in the shadows, despite Harvey publicly thriving since his return to Norm. And the movie sets this up in such a way that it clearly wants you to believe that Harvey is no longer Two-Face, and this is instead Two-Face Part 2, or a Second Face. But like, who, who else could this be? Is this Harvey Apollo? I don't think so. But I kind of love that the movie attempts mystery in the dumbest way imaginable. Like, there's shadow over the other side of Two-Face, even when he's not in the shadows. There is nothing to cast that shadow. That is simply half an unlocked character. If this happened anywhere else, I would say that this was terrible. Just god-awful. And probably unintentional. But given the information that this is a sequel to a series sans subtlety, this feels very on-brand. And when we finally get the big reveal of who Two-Face actually is, it's once again Harvey. It's always been Harvey. It never stopped being Harvey. Even if Harvey is going along with his own plans reluctantly, it's still Harvey. Because despite the facial reconstruction and fixing the scars on the outside, the real issue is the ones that are on the inside. And can I just ask, how is it possible that Batman 66 understood the purpose of a character but the juggernaut that is the Dark Knight somehow managed to get it wrong. I don't know, I, I'm just saying, that, that's just something interesting to point out. In all seriousness, I think they really made this character work in this continuity. And they did so by toning him down and reeling him back a little, but they still managed to capture the spirit of the sorts. This is a character I always thought would feel a little bit out of sorts in this universe. They made it work, he fits in perfectly here, he's a great addition to this universe. I'm upset that this is the only outing we'll get with this character. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying this is the picture-perfect Two-Face. This isn't the new pedestal. They did do things different, and they did add things to the character. Like now, Harvey's dark side not only has the capability of taking him over mentally, but also taking over him physically as well. I don't think I'd like this change anywhere else, but here, it's not bad. It fits the tone. It's obviously different, but different isn't always bad. I should also note that Two-Face proves to be Batman's most successful foe yet, managing to not only trick and trap the Cape Crusaders, but also managing to find out their secret identities. Which, to my knowledge, I believe no villain in the original series ever managed to do, despite it being very, very obvious. And I will say that William Shatner, despite his worst effort, is actually at the very least pretty passable in the role. Actually, I might even say that he's kinda good. His hammy over-the-top acting and bizarre dramatic pauses that he takes are kind of perfect for the series. And I think that they work really well when they're acted against Adam West's own bizarre dramatic pauses and over-the-top hammy acting. 
It's an incredible blend, and it, it works so well that you wonder how they haven't worked together before this. I don't know that William Shatner really cared about this role. I'm two-faced. <laughs> look at this, look at that. I don't really know that William Shatner cares about most things, but... What did you have to fundamentally understand about the Harvey Dent character to play this role? Well, you know, it's a cartoon. <laughs> I will say that this is some of my favorite work that he's done in years. Two-Face isn't even the only new addition to this universe. This movie also sets up several other future villains. Joining him is none other than the one-day Harley Quinn, Dr. Harleen Quinzel, whose future is even flirted with when she flirts with the Joker. And while that is a nice touch, and I do enjoy it, it's really odd thinking of this Joker attempting to manipulate or seduce someone. Like, like how would that story play out here? Also new to the story is Dr. Hugo Strange. And he kind of plays an integral role in Two-Face's origin, being the contributing force behind Harvey's makeover due to his evil suction machine malfunctioning. And what a sentence that was. He later actually joins the dueling dual identities of Harvey Dent in his plan to turn Gotham City, uh, uh more balanced, I guess. It's interesting to see this character in this environment, but he doesn't get any kind of characterization. He's just a bad guy doctor we see once or twice. And it doesn't seem like a whole lot of changes were made to his character to better fit him into what's going on here. So his inclusion is a little bit, uh, pardon the pun, strange. Ultimately, would I recommend this movie? Yes, without a shadow of a doubt. If you're a fan of the original series, you'll love this, as it doesn't only serve as a callback, but a step forward as well. It's a love letter to the past that's creating a future right here in the present. It's a fantastic movie, and even if you didn't watch The 60s Show, I think you could still enjoy this. But to be able to really, truly appreciate it for all that it is, you're gonna want to watch the original series. I give this my highest recommendation, because this is almost all positive, no negative. Except for maybe one or two facts. I'm really shocked and kind of sad that Batgirl never made so much as an appearance in this movie, or in the one that came before. The audience got such little time with her that it would be really nice to extend that just a little bit more. You know, who knows what the character would be up to now? What, what, what's she doing? The lack of an inclusion is a little bit odd, especially when considering how much love there was for the show and some of its lesser remembered characters. You know, you would think that there would be a spot for the second sidekick, but apparently not so. And even more unfortunate is that prior to the movie's release, Adam West sadly passed away, never getting the opportunity to see his last effort as the Caped Crusader. The man left behind a legacy, even as the actor and the brand were in the late stages of life, it still seemed like there was still more to do. Still more stories to tell, more memories to make. But I guess that's a sign of a good storyteller. You always leave them one and more. This was a very beautiful way to say goodbye to a man who embodied a legend. Adam West, thank you for all of your contributions, the memories that you've left us fans with, and of course, all the dancing one can ask for in one lifetime. So in lieu of my usual closer, I'd like to leave you all with this. I am vengeance. I am the knight. And that was V Infuso. Just remember, if you're not tuning in, then you're missing out. So, if you like the words that came out of his mouth hole, and you too would like to become a V Generate, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, nerds! And if you're not joining the fun, you're in for one. Bad day. And you know what they say about having one bad day. <laughs> Catch him next time. Same bad time. Same bad channel. Who's Adam West? Wait, who's Adam West? <laughs> Adam West. Yeah. I'm Adam West. <gasps> Adam West!
West. I think that's Adam West as Batman. You're Adam West.